I had a, my dearest friend was my deadliest rival. He was a man called Mike Townsend, who was on the Kentish Express. And because Rye was on the border between Kent and Sussex, we were supposedly enemies, but we were actually very good friends. We kept up the rivalry where work was concerned, but we, we were like brothers, you know, the rest of the time. I mean, we'd go off and do holidays in Wales and things um, in his car. And one day he came across a BSA three-wheeler, which had been made in 1935, the year I was born. Um, and it was on sale for 30 pounds. So we decided we'd each put up 15 pounds and go shares in this BSA. And we would <coughs> refurbish it and, and then make the journey to India in this BSA. We poured over maps, we did routes, and we wrote off to BSA trying to persuade them that, you know, to sponsor us. And um, I didn't even know how to drive, but he agreed to teach me in this BSA, which made a strange buttering sound. We couldn't understand why. It sort of chog, chog, chogged along. Anyway, we went back to my father's house in Hastings and St. George's Road to display this latest acquisition. And um, he took one look on the bonnet and he said, you're not going anywhere in this. It's only got two cylinders and one of them is seized up. <laughs> it's not reparable, repairable. So that was the end of the big adventure. That only fired my determination all the more to get out of England as fast as possible. And <coughs> The, the trigger to do that came when I was granted leave to go to Salisbury, where I'd been on my scooter before, to spend Christmas with my family there. My parents were going, and I had an aunt and uncle I was very fond of living there. And um, having granted me the leave, at the last moment, the office withdrew it because they wanted me to cover the Boxing Day hunt from battle, which was outside my territory. Well, that wasn't even in my territory. I was furious. I said, why, why do I have to go to battle? Because they'd lost their man from battle. And the hunt of all I loathed blood sports. I hated the horse riding set, you know, with their airs and graces. And I said, this is the last straw. I handed in my resignation. And I applied for a passage to Canada, God knows why. Australia had turned me down. I wanted to be a sheep farmer in Australia. When I gave them my experience, they said, no, you're not equipped for, <laughs> for the outback, mate. <laughs> so Canada was my next choice. And um, I was granted a 10 pound assisted passage to Canada. I was going to live in London, Ontario, because it looked about the furthest south you could get to Canada. And I was all set, the, the date was set when I would sail. I went <coughs> to my uncle and aunt in Salisbury, Bulford Army Camp actually, just outside on Salisbury Plains, and to, to bid farewell. And in one evening, my entire future changed. They talked me out of it. My aunt said, you'll be miserable in Canada. Earth, you want to go to Canada for it. She was so right, as I subsequently discovered. Um, she said, for God's sakes, come with us to Malaya. We're about to go to Malaya. Malaya had always been my dream, you know. He, my uncle was being posted. He was in the Royal Signals Corps. And he was going to Kuala Lumpur. And they were heading out two months after I was due to visit them. So I went and changed all my plans. My uncle got me a job as a teleprinter operator in Bulford Army Camp, and um, I took window cleaning on the side with my bicycle and a bucket to eke out my wages, lived in a little farmhouse outside Bulford, walked to work over the moors. Um, didn't know anything about teleprinter operating, but I learned it as I went. And tried to save up enough money for the seafare to Malaya.
1857 was a, <coughs> the worst possible year to choose to go east because the Suez Canal crisis and the Suez crisis had blocked the canal. Uh, NASA was <coughs> determined to prevent ships going through and all shipping had to go via the Cape, so which doubled the journey east. It also meant that um, there were fewer jobs in the merchant navy and I, with my lack of experience again, uh, tried unsuccessfully to be a deckhand and work my passage out east in Conrad, Joseph Conrad fashion, you know, another of my idols. Um, so that door was closed to me and I, all I could do was continue sitting at the keyboard of this teleprinter in this military barracks and in my spare time washing windows to save up the money. And then in the summer of 1957 I read of the very first overland bus service to India run by an Irishman called Paddy Gary Fisher. So I wrote away and applied to go on this trip. The first trip had just started at Easter of 57 and I wrote immediately to try and get on the next one. I was told the fare was 85 pounds and I'd have to bring all my own food and you know, etc, etc. So that was my target. It was a lot cheaper than going by sea. Going by air was unthinkably expensive in those days. So I saved and saved and managed to get together the fare to make the trip at the end of August in 57 when the bus had just got back and Paddy Garrett Fisher was uh, getting his second wind to make the next trip. He did this single-handedly in those days. He had this battered old pre-war bus with no clearance at all. It was so low that, um, you know, the merest pebble in the road could knock out the exhaust pipe. But he ripped out the back seats, or two rows of back seats, to allow for our luggage. And he did <clears throat> put in a lot of tents and cooking equipment. Um, for the desert and spades to dig our way through. So we set off from Victoria Coach Station on the 31st of August 1957 and there were buses leaving for Margate and Brighton and South End and in the middle of it all was this sort of khaki coloured bus that in every other respect looked like the other buses but down the side was this map of the route from London to India with this wild claim, you know, the India Man, first ever bus service from London to India. So naturally, people who were going off to have their little weekends at Brighton and South End would stop and aghast at this bus. Like, how do I get onto this, you know? But we were already booked, all 16 seats were filled. As it turned out, half the passengers were men and half were women and we were from all places there was a Pakistani girl, Jamila Khan, there were Canadians, Australians, it was great fun. Um, we made a great team. Anyway we set off in this contraption. The total spending money I had, all I'd been able to save in addition to the bus fare of 85 pounds was 45 pounds for the entire journey and I just hoped that I would be able to eat this out but of course Europe proved disastrously expensive I'll never forget having to pay five shillings for a coffee in St Mark's Square in Venice the biggest outlay I'd ever had to pay so I existed on loaves of bread and cheese and always chose the cheapest hotel Doss House or whatever. And the further east we got, the less expensive it became. The journey, the total journey took 
altogether 45 days, so it worked out at a pound a day. We went through France, Italy, Northern Italy, Yugoslavia, which was still an integrated country then, very interesting, and still under Tito, of course. Um, and then next was Bulgaria, that's right, which was still a closed country um, in the communist bloc. We were given one day to get through Bulgaria. Our cameras were sealed. We weren't allowed to stop anywhere except Sofia, which was the capital. And the only place we were allowed to stay in Sofia was the most expensive hotel, uh, which was catering to Russian politicians, visiting politicians. I remember everywhere we went, we drove at great speed through this really relative tiny country, but we did have to spend the night in Sofia. Um, everywhere we went, the peasants would stop and wave. And we would wave back, and we wondered why they were so friendly. And we realized they'd been taught to wave to any passing vehicle for fear it might contain some <laughs> Russian diplomat or something. So we got a very warm reception. And when we got to Sofia, the bus was followed through the streets by young men clinging onto the sides, pleading with us to take them out of the country. Please, at least, if, we can't, if you can't smuggle me into the back, be my pen friend, you know, anything to escape from that straitjacketed society. But, um, yeah, from Bulgaria we went to Turkey. And, um, and what was Turkey like? Oh, I loved it. It mm. was the East. Mm. Mosques, minarets, smells and spices that reminded me of India, you know. Um, I loved it. Very friendly people, too. Um, we had a sad experience at Ankara. It, <clears throat> one of our passengers came down with Asian flu, so we were forced to stay in Ankara for a day and we went roaming in the hills above Ankara, the old quarter of Ankara and the scene was very charming. I took lots of photographs of the um, ravine below where they were obviously trying to improve the canal that would flow through it and uh, put embankments and so on. There were lots of tractors and cranes working down there. We got distracted by a group of children who were singing some songs and we took their photographs and then there was a yell from the side of this parapet where we'd just been and we returned to find absolute chaos. A wall of water had swept down from the hills and totally swept away everything that was in that ravine. All the people, all the cars, all the cranes, it blotted them out. It was a, just a streaming mass of brown torrent. Um, and it was ghastly. I, mean, I believe hundreds were killed in a few minutes. Uh, people who were living alongside and the waters were climbing were desperately throwing furniture out of their windows to salvage what they could, you know, as the flood rose. Apparently, some ancient reservoir, after weeks of rain, miles and miles away, mm -hmm. had finally burst and um, sent this entire reservoir of water down through Ankara. So, it was very difficult to make our way back to the hotel through these floodwaters, but we eventually did, and then we had to figure out how to get out of Ankara because the immediate environs had suffered similar damage and a lot of the roads were closed. We actually had to change our route. We had to go down through southern Turkey, southeastern Turkey, which put added days to the journey and sent us through this heartland of backwards Turkey, you know, sort of almost desert-like conditions, little mud-walled villages clustered under hills. Um, people sort of tilling the land, what little poor soil there was, 
with oxen. Very picturesque, but also very run down and sad. And then we crossed through the mountains in the shadow of Mount Ararat, where <laughs> the ark supposedly came to rest. Um, we crossed into Iran, which in those days was run by the Shah, very efficiently, I thought. Um, and it was a lovely country to travel through. The mosques were unbelievably stunning. And the people were very educated and charming. And Iran was a thriving Western style metropolis. I thought the Iran had, or the Shah had done wonders with it. Um, Paddy, our driver, who did the whole journey on his own, had his wife, Moti, from South India, seated on a bedroll beside him as he drove. And she would feed him cold lentils, cold dal to keep him going. And we were very much in his hands. He would drive as far as his resources would take him. And then fall asleep at the wheel, pull up the side of the road, fall asleep at the wheel, often miles from anywhere, leaving us to debate what the hell we were supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> to spend the night. You know, we'd go to the back and we'd try and yank out these dreadful old tents which had World War I surplus, I think, people in World War II. <laughs> and often the ground was so damn hard, you aluminium tent pegs, they would buckle the first time you tried to, they, they wouldn't penetrate the soil, it was baked like clay. So there we were struggling to wreck these tents and eventually we just give up. We had these lilo mattresses, these air-filled mattresses, primitive things. You had to blow and blow and blow and blow. So we eventually had this sort of ridged, contoured thing to collapse onto. And it was cold at night in the desert. So we grabbed these tents and we'd whirl around them like whirling dervishes until we'd wrapped the tents around us and then we'd fall over hopefully onto these lilo mattresses which often just gave way with a groan and a sort of protracted hiss. <laughs> so we'd end up with just a few sicknesses of canvas between us and the, and the desert. And so, uh, and what about the food? What, what were you eating in the desert? Ah, oh, whatever we could grab hold of. Again, it was very cheap. Naturally, we'd stop at every marketplace we could find and get whatever meat and vegetables they had. I teamed up with a, a very nice Londoner called Nigel Service. And um, <laughs> neither of us could cook, but we perfected this omelette-type dish, garnished with whatever vegetables we could find which we called Mozer because we compounded the name after the first syllables of each of our names, Moss and Service. <laughs> so it's Mozerb. And everyone would ask, what are you eating tonight? Mozerb, of course, and what else was there? So do you remember quite well the, you know, the characters that you were travelling with? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, a very mixed bunch. Mostly youngsters. Um, great fun. You know, interestingly enough, I was browsing the net the other day and I came across this site called the Overland site where I found my book mentioned not only that but quite a, a generous little review of it that journey to in the Indiaman which was the first of a very protracted um, series of voyages that went ran, that company ran for years until Paddy Garrow Fish Fisher died much later and then developed fleets of buses, air conditioned, you know. So he carried on making the journey for yes, for years after? Yes, and I hired a whole crew of drivers to help him. They made a lot of money apparently. Hmm. But we were in their prototype early days. And so what were you doing whilst the bus was driving? Were you reading this suppose? Or? Yes, reading, chatting, singing, um, or just 
viewing the countryside, mm. which of course became more and more barren mm. as we progressed. I mean, the worst stretch was the Dashtilu Desert, where there, li there wasn't any road. You simply had to cross the desert. And you can imagine a bus that was built to make the run to Margate didn't have the sort of clearance you needed to cross the sand dunes. So Paddy would negotiate with these drivers of these huge Mercedes trucks to tow us across this desert. And of course the heat of day, nobody could do anything. <laughs> nobody could do anything. Are you, is it too cold? No, 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 sorry. Just go. Nobody could do anything in the heat of day. So we'd all lie in the shade of these buses and these lorries playing chess or cards or chatting as best we could with these Iranian lorry drivers, you know. And I was incredibly thirsty. I was always running out of water. Mm. And I remember um, I'd eaten my last watermelon, so I was really thirsty. I begged this Iranian lorry driver to ask him if he had any water at all, so he said, Follow me, and we went round to his radiator where he undid the drainage cap at the bottom of the radiator, and out came this thick brown liquid full of rust. But it had been boiled, of course, so it was perfectly safe. <laughs> I had to swallow that. <laughs> ah, that's fun. And then we towed this damn bus with planks of wood through the desert. There's the moment the sun set, off we went, you know, a few yards at a time, putting planks under the wheels, pushing, shoving, you know, lurching our way across this damn desert. So how long did this journey take? Ooh, this crossing it's took until you. about 6 a.m. the following morning, mm -hmm. when we reached anything like some firm soil under mm -hmm. our wheels. Mm -hmm. That was a nasty experience. I was going to say, was there any points during the journey where you thought that you might get stuck there or that you wouldn't kind of come to the other side? Mm, that was a pretty low point and when we broke our spring, one of our mm. springs in Yazd and there was no automobile repair shop present and Paddy had to hitch a ride to the next town and scour around for something suitable to bring back. Mm. Uh, but otherwise it was pretty good. And so how did you do the final leg of the tour to, to Malaya? Well we <coughs> ended the journey in, the bus ended at Bombay, in spite of the fact that the, it claimed to be going to Calcutta. Paddy had decided the first trip had done the Calcutta leg and he wanted to do Bombay instead. So we all went to Delhi and our last day was our fellow passengers was at Agra. The Taj Mahal, moonlight, you know, an August moon. It was actually, I presume, the same moon that we're about to see here in Hong Kong. Mm. It was fabulous. Um, we saw the Taj by moonlight, this enormous moon. And um, I'll never forget going down to Sh <coughs> Sher Jahan. What's his name? Shia, Umtaj was his wife. Shia Khan? Who was the guy who built the, the Taj? Anyway, uh, whoever he was, there was his tomb with Mumtaj beside him uh, in this most romantic mausoleum in the world. Then uh, Robin Whitelaw and I, he was a Canadian architect. We both wanted to go to Calcutta and the bus was going southwest instead of southeast, so we parted company with the rest of the crew and we caught a train from Agra station to Calcutta. And by rotten timing it was the Diwali festival, which was the big festival and everybody was traveling. We couldn't get a seat in second class. Um, we could only get into third class, which as you can imagine was absolutely crammed. And, uh, we were sort of huddled in a little space by one of the windows. No way of moving, you know, it, you just have to hope that you could hold out to the next station and then try and make a dash to the toilet. Um, we shared a, 
a shanty of wine, our last little shanty of wine, which had got all the way from Venice, I think. It had lasted us. We'd laid up a huge store of red wine in Venice. And um, we were sharing this when this very disapproving looking Indian next to us, scowling at us in a very discouraging way. And we thought we were being very rude by not offering him any. So we proffered this shanty towards him and he nearly collapsed. He was shocked because we were sharing this bottle. He was um, the highest caste of Indian Brahmin where you're not supposed to let your lips touch anything that's touched anybody else's lips. So you know, oh dear. We'd already had our taste of Brahmins in, in India because we stayed at a rest house, a dark bungalow as they used to call them in those days, which was managed of all people by Brahmins who wouldn't let us use their kitchen because we were not Brahmin. So we had to cook on our little primer stoves in the, in the garden. So did you get a, a real sense of the caste system in oh, India? Yeah. In, in I'd seen it at work, of course, in my younger years, yes, yes. and I loathed it. I thought it was mm -hmm. India's great tragedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because of it, you know, it was, I think it was why the Raj took so well to India, because the caste system in England was hardly any better. Mm -hmm. You know, the cl classification of the, the Indians. English social strata was so well defined that they must have been in their element going to India they could sort of fit in very beautifully because they were the upper class and below them were the Brahmins and so on and so forth. Were there untouchables in your kind of community as well? Or um, I didn't consciously come across any. The only person from that subcontinent who travelled with us was Jamila Khan, who was terribly anti-imperialist, but she was Pakistani. And uh, although she could get a visa to get into India, she wasn't very approving of, of India or of what Britain had done with it. She was great fun, a woman after my own heart, <laughs> Jamila and what, Khan. And what was it like going back to India, revisiting it? What were your emotions on coming back? Oh, I loved it. I loved traveling through India. I wanted it to last and last, you know. But I was running out of money, and my last stop was in Calcutta, where I was going to stay with friends that we'd known and from our own days in Calcutta. They'd been neighbors of ours, the Maidmans. Um, and I knew that Leslie, who was the same age as me and had gone to St. Xavier's College in Calcutta with me, he was um, a son of a newspaper editor on the Statesman newspaper. So I kind of hoped that I might get a job to eke out the rest of my stay. And he put the kibosh on that. He said, no, no chance at all. You know, um, the English weren't welcome in India anymore except as tourists. So um, I thought, what the hell do I do now? I'd run out of money. Fortunately, a telegram arrived from my aunt in Kuala Lumpur saying, I know that you're out of money. Get on this boat. We've booked your passage. So I went down to Kidapur docks and boarded a British India vessel called the Santia, which was sailing from Calcutta down to Penang, and I believe ending in Singapore. A lovely ship. Um, I don't think it's running anymore, only about 20 cabins or so, cargo ship. Um, it was Conrad again, it was marvellous, it was my dreams, I was reading Conrad on the voyage. <laughs>